I guess we're talking about companies where we've had exits. So one of the successes I refer to is uh, <clears throat> we backed an entrepreneur, a European entrepreneur, actually. Um, this is you know, typical of the types of companies we're backing, the global base, who really deeply believed in the India back end um, and came and built a, a back office here and a, 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 you know, really a BPO solution here. Uh, with very, very high analytic skills <clears throat> that he then sold to the rest of the world, particularly catering to hedge funds. And this is a company called Globop. And uh, we had a you know, fascinating story. We backed him when he was a very, very small $15 million revenue business. Um, and we then took the company public five years later, and it was about a 5x return for us. Uh, and the company now is about 3,500 people sitting in Malad in a, in, a, in a center, and it's now the largest and I think most sort of strategic hedge fund outsourcing businesses in the world. So that was a great story. And uh, from our portfolio, the, uh, our investments are a bit younger. Uh, Apollo Hospitals is about four years in the portfolio, it's about two and a half times currently, but it's a public company. Uh, I get Putney is younger still, but uh, it, it, we back one company to buy another, and sort of the integration is a year old and it's gone very well. So, you know, positive from, from that perspective. Um, any response to the gentleman's question on clean tech? Does anyone know that space? Particularly? Yeah, I, maybe just a quick response that's an area we're looking at. It, it certainly has immense potential and uh, to some extent will be driven by funding from VC and PE, not just uh, PE. And uh, you know, if you look at the energy sector in India, 65% of India's energy sector is thermal, coal, coal fired uh, plants. And as everyone knows, there are huge issues with, uh, with the availability and the pricing uh, of coal. Uh, so both uh, from the perspective of adding capacity, uh, as well as of course the environmental consciousness, the uh, clean tech sector is uh, is going to be huge. Now it depends within clean tech sector also where you look at. You know, we're we're seeing a lot of activity in wind. We're now beginning to see activity in solar. Although solar, there's still a huge issue about pricing subsidy and how long that will continue. And do you trust the government to continue the pricing that they promised you today for 15 years down, or do you not? Uh, there's also biomass, but biomass is a very sort of local and relatively uh, smaller business. And of course, there's hydro. Hydro is very important, and in India at least, uh, when you talk about clean tech. Small hydro, which is uh, 50 megawatts or less, is considered to be part of uh, uh, clean tech. I think that also has uh, a lot of potential uh, given the number of you know mountainous areas, but also rivers, runoff rivers, small hydro plants. Are, are so I, I'm a big believer in the clean tech story. Thank you. So we have an investment in, in the clean tech sector in a company called Green Co, which is uh, the second largest uh, renewable energy company in India. And they focus on two sectors, two subsectors within that, which is small hydro and, uh, and wind. Uh, so those are in our opinion the most attractive segment. There is no doubt that clean tech is going to be very, very important. But again, coal prices, you know, as you've seen over the last four or five years, despite the slowdown in China, have actually held up. And having uh, an energy uh, spare, there is no feedstock cost, is, is phenomenal. So I think small hydro and wind both. Uh, are very exciting sectors. We are less excited about biomass and, uh, and solar at the moment, but I think these two in particular are, are very exciting. Great, thank you. Thanks. Lady on the left, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Bharat Desai in the earlier session had said that trade and investment can bring peace. And my question is targeted to Ms. Mr. Darius Pandol because he's from the Silk Road Advisors Group. And myself belonging to Manipur, a next generation trying to find peace by looking at economic models for change. My question is, the look is policy of India, whether that has really helped about bringing the economic growth in my region, which is home to 40 million people in India's northeast of eight states. You have mentioned about 300, 300 to 500 funds which have been invested in India. Is any of that fund also looking at this part of India? And in the next 10 years, what do you think that we have to bring change in trade investment to find the peace in that region? Thank you. Uh, no, I, I think that's, that's a very important point. Uh, as I reflect, if there is adequate private equity activity in that part, I think the answer is unfortunately not. Uh, and the reason that has not happened is that A, uh, I guess there is less economic activity. And because of less economic activity, there seems to be at least less deal flow from the perspective of companies that require private equity funding. Uh, and, but I think given the inherent potential of that area, I hope uh, and I believe it can change. 
But I think the most important thing in, uh, in areas like that is that the local governments need to set up an enabling environment for the setting up and development of business, which is essentially what is needed then to attract capital. Attracting capital is a secondary uh, aspect. The primary aspect is the enabling environment to set up and run businesses in a, in a conducive environment. And hopefully that will happen over time. Thank you. Gentleman on the right. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, it's been really great to hear your views. I'm a, my name is Sid Misra, I'm a student here, and I wanted to ask about your limited partner investors. Uh, a lot of funds uh, are sort of global funds or funds that are originated in Europe or the US. How do you manage expectations with them and are you looking to raise funds from Indian LPs and what are the differences? Um, specifically asked this because I did business in India, it was very hard to manage expectations with our VCs sometimes. And I wanted to know what your views on that are. So why don't, why don't I take a crack at that? Um, I think uh, in terms of Indian LPs, uh, it's a very, very nascent market. Um, some uh, local GPs, Indian GPs, have tried to raise parallel funds, uh, is my understanding. Uh, typically from high net worths, although there are some institutions starting to invest. That's been a, um, a bit of a double-edged sword as well because uh, especially in volatile economic times, my understanding is a lot of that uh, local LP commitment has evaporated. So the high net worths have sort of withdrawn and reduced commitments, which is you know not been great for, for from the GP perspective. In terms of how a global LP like uh, GP like ourselves uh, uh, talks to LPs about investing in India, and I'd love perspective from some of my my co-panelists. Um, you know, they're very excited about India, actually, because if you, uh, you know, we've, there's a, been a little bit of doom and gloom here today, um, or reality check, uh, but if you compare the economic growth prospects of in India versus Europe or versus the US, whereas the US is coming back a little bit, it, the growth is still significantly higher. And I think to the point that Akhil made, if you look forward 10 years, uh, you can see this being a much bigger economy and, and therefore the capital need to be, be bigger. So all, all of our LPs, uh, I think bar none, are very encouraging uh, of our expansion in India and our strategy in India. I can't say that the same was true five years ago. Uh, they were more skeptical, but I think some of the proof is, uh, some of the proof of the pudding is also the eating. So, you know, they, we, we've taken incremental gradual steps, we've not made any mistakes and it seems to be working.